Hi guys, and welcome back to the Gym Girls Locker Room Podcast, hosted by me, Sydney Husty, also known as Sid Gross. Today we have a very special episode. We have the one, the only, Anna Archer on. We covered a lot. We covered our first funny meeting, Anna's journey with her eating disorder and her road to recovery, her evolution with her social media platforms, the challenges that come with having a job on social media, Anna's running tips and what's next for Anna. There was a lot of really, really special moments in this and I know that it's going to be something that you guys are going to love and be able to take lots from. Um, I do just want to give a trigger warning, obviously with the nature of the topics that we've discussed. There is mention of eating disorders, so if that's not right for you, please um, either listen to the first episode or tune in to the next one next week. Before we get into the episode, please do us a massive favour. Subscribe if you are listening on apple or watching on youtube and give us a follow if you're listening on spotify you can find us at gym girls locker room on instagram and facebook and um yeah i hope you loved the episode as much as i did okay anna archer hello Uh, uh, she's here oh my gosh honestly like i don't feel like i could have had anyone else as a first guest it was like an immediate decision for us, wasn't it? Really? We were we were like I feel honored. I'm your first guest. We were like, there's no other person. I know she's in Australia because this girl's been all over the globe, <laughs> but we were like, there has to be a way. So that, that kind of like actually when we were talking earlier, the deadline was truly for you. Oh. But I wanna start because I feel like the audience will really enjoy this. And I also don't know if you I've spoken to you about it, but I want to start with like how we met. <laughs> I don't oh know. my gosh, yeah. I don't know if you remember, but I actually first met you at the Gymshark store yes. opening as a fan. <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah. No. No, so I was not a Gymshark athlete, nor ha- I think I must have had about, what do we reckon, 30,000 like followers or something on TikTok. But were you there like invited as a Gymshark? No, no, no. I was there as a fan no way. I literally like turned up and you walked up to me I remember it so vividly. Oh, wait did I say I watched your videos so you walked up to me okay. and you said you had like a neon outfit on and you said like you walked up to me and you said um you just looked at me and you said I've seen you on TikTok or I've seen your videos or something <laughs> I've and seen I your- was absolutely flabbergasted i was <laughs> internally screaming like it was it was so beautiful there we go yeah, but yeah. then no i a, remember that there's a part two to us meeting which is i mentioned this in my first episode if you guys um have already listened to that i was um on my way to lift manchester and they had i was like just freaking out entirely that whole sort of journey up there imposter syndrome like the works but beforehand on the journey they had asked me to go to the store the Gymshark store and to travel up with the other athletes <laughs> I get put in a taxi what was it a six man six man car yes <laughs> fully for I what was it four hours no plus? I think it was five and a half five and a half hours with Anna freaking Archer <laughs> I was dying and I was just like yeah and it was you know it was really special for me but I was just I remember just internally screaming the whole time Ellis and I were saying oh my god stop Ellis and I were like well obviously I eased into it but I think Ellis was saying it'd be funny to look back and find text messages of me just going I can't like you know crazy that is so so anyway no I remember we were in the car and I was like oh my god sick like it's just us two and then we were chatting what for non-stop like five and a half hours like (laughs) I think you found out more than some of my friends knew about me I was like this happened this happened honestly and we were just like right we bonded and then like for the whole like Manchester trip we were so busy I don't think we like hardly talked. No. It was like, no, we had a good catch up. <laughs> I know. Yeah. It's like, what a way to meet someone, literally spend like hours in a car with them. Yeah. But I think something that really struck me about you was just like how, like, I don't know, just so like mature and like self assured you are and secure in yourself. And it's so funny to me that you're literally 22. Tw- like, you're 22. 22. <laughs> but um, yeah, like, is that something you feel like you've always been like I I feel like you've I've heard you kind of say before like you've always kind of been like a little bit silly a little bit goofy and like weird in the best kind of way (laughs) but do you feel like yeah you've always been like pretty like I don't know self-assured and secure it's definitely been a journey I have always had some element of Anna and I think the more I've gone through this whole journey of life 
you realize you can be even more you and you go back to the tendencies, not tendencies, but the traits you had when you were a child, you know what I mean? Loud, dancing, being all silly. And so it's almost like growing up is kind of going back to those roots. But in terms of being like confident or self-assured, that's been a journey itself too. Um, I haven't always been like that. And it took some very low moments to then realize that the journey that is most important to me is becoming my com- like is being confident in yourself and I think it shifts so much within your life like it helps so many things line up when you are confident in yourself and any time that you feel like the world's crashing on you it's just you're losing a little bit of that you know when someone's rooting for you you're just rooting for yourself yeah. everything feels like it's working like what happens. are like things that you kind of did in those moments where you were like struggling and then you just like I don't know because I see you before me and you're just like like Anna is that girl like she really is I'm sure everyone listening who knows Anna knows she just like I don't know I feel like you just like embody just like just Anna right Aww. so it's like how did you get to that point and I don't know like it do you well we were speaking earlier but like you still have that like those ups and those down days oh my gosh. and all the time yeah. like I think this week last two weeks I've really struggled and we talked about this before um and you know when you are seen as an energetic person online I find it really hard now to show up and not be that person now I have a podcast myself and it's been such a kind of support for me the whole time I've been doing social media because I can turn up as whatever I want within that you know I share my low days all the time but the thing is is I come back on my podcast and I share about it once I've resolved it right now I'm in a position where I haven't resolved anything I I don't feel on top of the world again and so I like to share things when I'm on top of the world I go I've been there I felt that but I'm here now and this is what I did or this is what I've done and I feel like at the moment I'm like no I'm still feeling anxious and like it's just taking those baby steps it's protecting yourself it's you know that voice that goes, it's okay. You want someone else to tell you, just lie on the sofa this evening. Yeah. Just chill out. You you probably feel yeah. it, don't you? Like, <laughs> just take the day off. Yeah. You've got to be that for yourself. Yeah, And it's definitely. so hard, but as soon as you start doing that, you can calm yourself and letting other people in too. Oh my God, was, I, I thought I'm always one to kind of share my emotion to some extent, but I realised that I definitely do push out friends or people that are associated with work and I'm like no they don't need to know how I'm feeling I'll just tell them I'm okay I'm the strong one I'm the one that's got their shit together yeah and you know even yesterday like I was with a friend who I normally support a lot and I just crashed onto her I was like I'm not doing good she was like it's okay and you 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 realize that when you do open up yeah before you can create quite a story um but that's kind of what helped me a little bit recently yeah but I don't know whether you were kind of asking that go down a different avenue of I don't know, you kind of said, like, being more Anna. I don't know. Well, yeah, I think, I don't know. It's just, like, you... I think I want to... I think I want to dive in more to, like, earlier days Anna because I feel like for everyone that's, like, such a... Those are such formative, like, years and it really shapes you as a person. So I feel like me as an observer of, like, your content, um, it seems like you're kind of always... I don't know, trying to like channel that like inner child. I don't even yeah, know if that's a conscious 100%. thing, but I feel like that's a really like healing part for a lot of people. And like, yeah, is that something that you consciously try to do or? Um... Yeah, I think I naturally know what I enjoy and those things are potentially more childish things. But growing up and realizing that a really healing thing to do is to do things that your inner child would find fun and love and you know, one of the benefits to making your own your own money is you get to spend the adult money on charged things. Oh God, and yeah. I love doing that. Like, yeah. let's get some stickers and a fun pen. No, I know. Let's and like, like a bouncy castle birthday party. Let's do it. I know. <laughs> when I got invited to Anna's b- bouncy castle birthday party, I thought it's so on brand and I love it's it. It's so good. No, I love it. I love it. Um, <laughs> Like fitness for you as a child, like I know you've said in the past that like for you, you had so much fun like moving your body and would you say that you had like a really sort of healthy relationship with, and I'm talking like childhood. childhood. I know you did like all the activities. Yeah. You did all the clubs. That's something that like certainly really resonates with me, especially like, 
I know you spoke about like in the like as a, um, a child not always having the means you know your parents not always having the means yeah that's something that I really resonate with and I think like I was so totally one of those kids as well I'll be at the netball club I'll be at the bloody uh, swimming tennis yeah, yeah. Literally all of it and like I think yeah I think that's really nice to kind of like hear someone say that and would you say that you did have like a healthy sort of relationship with exercise as exercise a yeah um food and exercise I had a healthy relationship with with my body there was some when I was from the age of from probably six I had some body image stuff but really? I never knew that exercise made a difference yeah, and I never knew yeah, that yeah. food made a difference yeah I just thought your body was what you got and I didn't understand why other girls had smaller legs than me and that freaked me out bearing in mind when you look back I'm a tiny child it's just in your head I know but with exercise oh my god I loved it like it was just my way to be me I would just be moving around all day and yeah we didn't have loads of money and I remember there was times where I was so mad at my mum for not making me a pro in something because the drive is there the energy is there like I wanted to be like an elite athlete I wanted to be an elite gymnast yeah and my mum didn't let me do it and so I would practice in the garden and that's where I have my kind of background with handstands and stuff because I would play around in the garden for hours and I can do random things on the trampoline but in terms of like actual gymnastics training and stuff like that I don't have too much yeah um and so yeah I did loads of like tennis swimming gymnastics dancing trampolining all of that stuff but never was able to kind of make it elite and so when I went into secondary school it was really good that my school had lots of different kind of free squads and if you trained hard enough you could get into the top squad and then they would train you further so I was in like every squad (laughs) that's like because I've heard you say a few times on like different things that like you know you were never able to be like an elite yeah is there something that like is that something that you actually really wanted for yourself like wanting to be like the best or wanting to be at the top of something like is that something you felt you were always like pining for I I think you know when it takes certain people to do certain things. I think I just understood I had some sort of energy or drive. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, like that excites me, like training and becoming the best at something. That yeah. excites me. Mm-hmm. And then obviously when you go past 10 years old, 12 and you're 15 years old, to become an elite at a specific sport, obviously it's a lot harder, especially the ones that I enjoyed. Um, and so going on to when I was 18 I was like right okay maybe I'll just be like a PT when I'm older maybe I'll be like a PE teacher I don't know and then in a weird way obviously with socials it was like a different way and it's not necessarily on the athleticism it's more about you know the videos you make and so I kind of put some of my passion into video editing and creating a business but I feel like there is that part of me that wants to kind of excel in something and so yeah like just kind of excited at the moment, like going into high rocks. I know. Going into some things. Like, I think it'd be pretty cool to like get up quite high up. The things with me is I need someone to hold me accountable and I need someone to be like, right, you're doing this. Do you? Yeah. Oh, I, I in terms of something like that. Yeah. Like to be number one in high rocks. Oh, that's just short. Sure. Like, oh, so, yeah, I'm so, going to. So is that what we're going for? <laughs> <laughs> we're going for. Well, it literally just like came into my head the other day. I was like, how cool would it be? And then I was like, actually thinking about it. I was like, eh, okay, maybe like not, but I don't know. No, but I love that. I love that, that there's this thing in you that's just like, if you want something, yeah. you're just like, oh, okay, yeah. So I'm going to work now to get that because yeah. it feels like you realize that you really can achieve anything like if you want to. Um, okay. So has fitness always, have you always been involved with fitness exercise to some extent? Was there any points within your like teenage years or anything where you did drop not or really it's like been consistent yeah it's been consistent I remember I got in the gym when I was 13 and then yeah. like snuck in for a bit and then when I was 14 I can get a membership and then you know I probably took six months off here and there I never had a proper training plan I never had a split I mm-hmm. you know girls weren't really in the gym too much then you know if they were we were doing sit-ups and yeah. I was there doing like Chloe flips <laughs> off like no I, I was doing some random stuff you know that little bozo ball? It's a half ball. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'd do, like, no hand to cartwheels off that. Oh, okay. I would do, like, bat flips off it. I'd, like, do weird, like, pull-ups. Like, cast- I would just use it as a playground. Oh, I amazing. loved it. So my gym anxiety was never there because when I was 14, I strutted in there like I owned the place. I love and it. And I just did whatever I wanted. Like, I never went into kind of, like, the whole... Um, 
typical kind of weightlifting way. Then when I was 17, I dated a bodybuilder. Not great idea. <laughs> great, <laughs> great job. <laughs> and I learned a lot about like, okay, squats and this is yeah. shoulder press and this is all these things. So I learned a bit of my technique off. But you were actually really comfortable in the, in oh, the yeah. gym environment yeah. anyway. Crazy. Okay. So was like exercise, it was a playful thing. Have you ever, like, was it ever that throughout those years you were kind of leaning on it to kind of like stabilize mood or have you used exercise as a coping mechanism or for you is it just purely playtime and like oh I've definitely had my journey <laughs> oh yeah um <laughs> I think probably from the age of 17 yeah I was trying to use it to change my body maybe 16 um the other sports I was doing I wasn't doing it to change my body like I did school gymnastics because I wanted to do yeah I didn't know if you were gonna see I, well I was gonna say where did that come from because I feel like it's really like interesting like reflecting yeah e- even for myself reflecting on that really like kind of s- awkward state yeah. as a teenager it's like why did I have these thoughts of wanting to change my body and I just wondered was that from media was that from yeah. personal things going on was that from friendships can I you think, pinpoint that as I previously said I had body image issues from about six years old. I always thought I was bigger, but I didn't know how to change it or do anything about it. So it never kind of, I didn't start calorie counting when I was 10 years old. When I was 17, I said I had dated this bodybuilder. And so then suddenly you get taught about fitness pal and, you know, doing these workouts and burning calories and eating for this. And so I was starting to become aware. Oh, so there's numbers on the back of these foods and they mean something and whatever. And oh, if I exercise in this way, and I remember he put me on my first diet, which you could really question there. And it was a very low calorie diet and I did start losing weight and I put it back on pretty soon after. But that was the start of understanding what calories were and exercise and it was pretty downhill from there. Along with that, um, without making it too deep or anything, my dad did pass away. In that year, I started really struggling with my body And so there's a big kind of correlation there. And to take it back even further, when I started getting my bad body image when I was six years old, when my dad kind of left the fact, like when we separated. So I think there is a lot of dad stuff there. Yeah, like I almost wonder if it's like me, like I'm a a psychotherapist. Yeah, I I am not. (laughs) Let me psychoanalyze that. (laughs) But I do wonder, like, do you think it was like a sort of control thing? Have you ever wondered, like, almost like I thought where had like where did this come from I thought I'd be more loved if I was smaller that was it right I literally thought I'd be more loved I thought I'd be when I was six I and this is going very like niche specific onto Anna's six-year-old brain but we love it we love it I looked at other kids in the playground and they were all tiny they had these like stick thin stick thin legs and I thought you all have big homes a mum and dad I don't. And I genuinely thought it was because I was that little bit more muscular. And that's just crazy. What a six-year-old... It's when a young child goes through their parents going through a divorce. They'll go, is it because I'm not good enough at this? Yeah. And and a six-year-old brain is so, like not developed with emotional intelligence of what's actually happening yeah totally I, I mean, literally took it as that that's what I felt about you saying when you're in your teenage years as well is that like baby no yeah literally, like, no darling baby no like no there's no there's no way at all I really I really a lot of what you're saying really resonates with me I was always like a lot mu- more muscular which now looking I'm back like, and you're like you're tiny oh, yeah yeah. <laughs> like you know um but for me it was also being like really um I felt like the landscape of like the media and everything was so different then yeah. so like especially if you were feeling more vulnerable because of like home life situations you're just getting hammered with this kind of like this kind of heroin chic is like really you know yeah idolized and I feel like we live in a world now and I'm so you know happy for the younger generation where like every it feels like there's a lot more of like an embrace for like diversity and like all bodies and it feels no definitely like... I think I was I don't I think in my journey I don't think I was affected by the media really? okay. in terms of I wasn't on it so before okay. socials I wasn't on socials I love that. or like I, I did have like a Instagram and stuff but I never kind of like looked out for models or magazines okay okay so I really yeah. skipped 
okay. the whole kind of it was it was quite I knew obviously there was this whole thing about like growing up as a teenager you kind of just want to be slimmer of course yeah but I didn't get heavily maybe it's obviously in the background of movies with girls saying like oh you shouldn't eat carbs and yeah in the background but not really like I think mine was just a bit more yeah, like looking thinking and not enough. Yeah, needing needing to change. Okay, I'm learning how I can, and I'm gonna put full force into that. And so, yeah, there was when I was seventeen, eighteen. When I was eighteen, I went went down, went down with the eating disorder. <laughs> um, <let's try. laughs> you're like, God. hey, we find humor in the, <laughs> yeah. it's the darkest of times. <laughs> um, but yeah, struggled with that, and then went into recovery beginning of 2021 mm. because I struggled so much people say how did how did you make that choice how did you make that change how did you make the decision that you were going to come out of it there was no courage I gave up I gave up on the eating disorder it was taking up so much of my time in life it came to a point where every moment I was thinking about what went into my body how much I've done to burn it off um to go really into it, I was bulimic, so I was throwing up all the time. It's just completely the physical side of my throat hurting, eyes hurting, headaches, mm. teeth, just everything. And I was like, I give up. Like I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. And it was so hard, especially the fact that I grew a social media following. And I don't want to say it's the only reason, but back then I thought it was that. And thought it was what that you that I had a ripped body right okay because I had I was crazy lean I had about 10 abdominals on me like yeah. who knows where well, they came from we'll, we'll dive into the social media but I'm really interested yeah. if you're comfortable to speak more about like the sort of eating disorder yeah side of things. course because, you know for for me I feel like that's something certainly of the past I understand you massively carry that with you but it's something that I don't even kind of coming new into the space I don't even see that of you like I yeah I I'm not even really like I feel like maybe perhaps you don't touch on it so much with your content even so I'm it kind of you don't think it's I there. can't even believe that that is an Anna I kind of, of like that I really it's nice to yeah. hear that because well I'll just kind of go straight into it but yeah yeah please when I went into recovery a lot of my content was based on it because that's what I was going through and as I was kind of growing and in myself and recovering, it became less of my content. And I remember being feeling guilty at one point, like, oh, like, I feel bad that I'm not helping girls through that as much because that's what a lot of girls have followed me for. But we can only post what we're going through. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not thinking about the fact that it's okay to have chocolate for breakfast or I'm not having it for breakfast but casually I'll just have a bit of chocolate before I eat my breakfast old version of me would post it and be like girls it's okay if you want to eat chocolate or if you want to eat a muffin or if you want a big slice of pizza yeah because I'm now not contemplating that in my brain to have it or not I'm just eating it in my private life and I haven't even posted about it yeah so that's when the content changed I didn't have to tell people I just want to let you know it's okay if you missed a workout because I'm generally okay with it I, I'm not even thinking about it. And then sometimes when I see other people post about it, I'm like, oh crap, I used to stress about that, but I don't. And so that's why I don't post about it. So that's why my content has changed because I'm generally not thinking about it. But what I do kind of carry from that is the fact that I'm aware of triggers for people. I'm aware of what it feels like to be in that place. And so I will make my account pro positivity about your body, I will not speak about a diet. I will not speak about having to train every day, over-exercising, um, forcing myself to the gym, thinking that's discipline. I, I won't talk about that stuff because I've had a past with it, but I'm not making my content eating disorder vibes. Yeah. Does that make no, sense? No, that makes perfect sense. So what was the timeline of you starting your social media and your eating disorder? Were they around the same time or... Did you start social media when you were in recovery? The eating disorder stuff started before. Okay. I wasn't aware of it at all. I was going through one of those like crazy girl diet summers, has tried to diet for years, never worked. Suddenly it's working. So from a girl who never really could lose weight, I started dropping kilograms like nothing else. And I just was in the gym more 
my friends, some of my friends are worried. They're like, what are you doing? But again, nothing's on socials. We're in lockdown, hardly anyone's seeing you. My body is changing a lot. And I was quite nervous to go on this girl's holiday because it was two of my smaller friends. And so it was like motivation at the time to kind of lose this weight. And at the end of the holiday, you know, they kind of just leave me to do my stuff because they didn't want to get too involved because they were like, Anna's always the sporty friend. She know what she's doing. She's just getting fit. Do you know what I mean? Like, we'll just let her do her thing. And they're not very, they're so like far from having an eating disorder, even though, you know, they're just naturally slim. They're far from having an eating disorder. So they weren't able to kind of pick up on signs because they don't really know what's going on. Anyways, at the end of the trip, they're like, you should start a fitness account. Because I had broken up with my boyfriend the day before because he had cheated on me while I was on holiday. And um, they're like, you should start a fitness camp. And I was like, I don't know. Like, it wasn't a really th- a, a thing back then. Um, obviously, it was like three years ago or something. Yeah. Especially now, like, everyone has fitness accounts. And I cool. love it. Like, I literally love it. Um, and I started it. And so it was right at the beginning of me and this new body, new dieting, new exercise suit. So, at the time, the way my account started was sharing how I got to the body, sharing my low calorie meals, sharing the amount of exercise I was doing, the workouts, how many steps I had done a day, like quite. And then I had a, quite I, heavy on the dieting aspect. Yeah. And then I'd assume also you're in like a dangerous territory where because and we'll go into it, you completely blew up like, yeah, as if it was overnight then you're in a dangerous territory where you're starting to get positive reinforcement, I'd imagine, Yeah. right? For At the beginning, really it was all positive. It was, oh my gosh, your body, this is body goals. Like I had a very ripped body and it kept, you know, I kept looking like that for months on end. Um, and yeah, I grew really quickly, like within a month, you know, but each day I was growing like a thousand followers and that went on for like four months or something. Yeah. Um, my TikTok blew up and at the beginning it was very like oh my god this is dream body and then I had lost even more weight at one point just cycles of life and kind of feeling more anxious and then suddenly I had this kind of new kind of kind of a new stream of comments and it was all like this isn't healthy what is this like all of these stuff and I was like oh my god what do you mean like I was so in denial of having an eating disorder it wasn't the fact that I understood what they were saying and saying no I didn't know I had an eating disorder so people like you've got an eating disorder I was like no I don't and they're like oh okay then like or like really or I don't believe you or you're lying to us I was like I wasn't lying I had no idea so did you have so I'm guessing no is the answer to this question, but I'll still ask. So at the time, were there signs that your friends and family noticed? Like, did yeah. you get comments and were you still in denial? Or, you know, what what was kind of the experience of your friends and family around you yeah. after seeing this dramatic well, I had lost one of my best friends in that summer. Oh, gosh. I know, because she said she had wor- she was worried for me. And I was like, no, you're not allowed to be. Like, Aww. I'm fine. I'm fine. And she was like, no, like, I'm genuinely worried for you. And I pushed her out. And the month I started recovery, it was the first person I reached out to. I was like, I'm so sorry. And she's literally my best friend now. Like Aww. she's come for a sleepover tonight. Like she comes Love to that. my tours. She's, yeah. she's my bestie. Um, and so my friend said a few things. Um, my mom and my family, like my mom said a few stuff, but I was always so kind of like shrugging it off. I was like, no. And I almost took it, if we really take it in like a, not a twisted way, but I took it as positive reinforcement that my body was changing. Oh, my mum's noticed. Okay, good. You've lost enough weight. Let's let's lose some more. Like, let's make her worried. Because, you know, maybe I was lacking attention. Not too sure. Yeah. No, it's... <laughs> yeah, we're like, I'm just like kind of throwing it out there. But... No, no, no. But there's, there's so it's, much... It's what's behind it. And not many people always talk about that. Like, but... Yeah, no, 100%. Attention from parents is a big thing. Yeah. How did your... I know your mum was a yoga teacher, right? How was, how did that sort of like impact you? Is she always like... It's very interesting. She is so unaware of the eating disorder stuff. So she's not one of those kind of almond mums that, you know... <laughs> you said that. We heard you say before, banana, my mum's a banana chip mum. <laughs> yeah, like she's like literally like a banana chip mum. Um, or canola, I don't even know. But um, she never 
talked about diet culture in terms of herself. She never was trying to lose weight. In fact, she was always trying to gain weight. She was quite a, like a small yeah. woman. Um, and so she never did that, but she really liked her healthy food. So growing up, sugar was a bad thing. You know, one ice cream on the weekend, mm -hmm. very kind of limited things. There was no, it was all natural foods. Now, looking at it where I am now, I'm like, okay, it really wasn't the worst thing. In a way, she was kind of just looking out for her child. She was very interested in kind of the research of health. And, you know, you wouldn't go keep, like, feed your kid a load of lollipops for dinner. Naturally, you care about your child. You want to give them some protein, carbs, veggies, all of that stuff. So I can see now, at the time, I had built this big relationship, good food, bad food. Mm -hmm. Right, Cocoa Pops, Nutella, any sort of junk food is bad food. And then you've got the healthy food. And so what that meant was... Every time I went around a friend's house when I was younger, I was that kid that would eat so much of all of their food. Yep. If they had a chocolate stash, oh my God, that was done by the time I had left their house. If we had a sleepover with friends, I would have used the whole jar of Nutella because I knew I wasn't going to have any of that for like months on end. Um, and so it kind of created this thing. My mum didn't do that purposely and I know no. that. And, it, and it's taken me a long time to un unteach that basically, if that's a word unlearn <laughs> oh yeah unlearn <laughs> unlearn that <laughs> okay cool amazing um and then so you you've got your socials going you've also got the eating disorder you're in denial yeah socials are blowing up and then was it an acceptance first and then yeah it was kind, kind of, of transition into recovery or it was kind of that as I said like giving up so it came to a point where everything was becoming too much I was binging and throwing up too many times my day my thoughts were just spiraling and I was like, okay, I can't actually function. Again, it was really hard for me to make, not hard for me to make this decision, but alongside me becoming obsessed with my body, I became obsessed with my videos and doing well and growing. And you know that when you start growing, you then expect it every single day. And I was growing that much. And a part of me thought that I was growing because I had abs and that I looked a certain way. And so I was like, oh my gosh, so you're telling me I've got to make a personal journey of putting on weight and being okay with that and not dieting. And then a career kind of journey of one, slowing down my videos or changing my narrative, mm -hmm. but also two, not being the same thing that I thought got people in at the first place, my body. And yeah, so I kind of just like, it was really hard, but I came off socials and I remember going to Gymshark and I was like, I'm struggling so much. I need time off and they were like that's fine and I took I think two months I didn't turn up on socials and I just fully hid away the reason I did that was because I was so ashamed about the weight gain on my face and body going from like wearing sports bra and shorts in every single video having ripped abs I said I'm not coming on socials and I gained a load of, like I gained a load of weight and then I was like what do I do how do I turn up like imagine looking so different and it was so quick. I think I gained 15 kilos in two weeks. Like it, really? Like it, was, it was a lot. And there is no, to anyone who's listening, there is no right or wrong or your journey is so personal. I went through binging and I, and I stopped the throwing up part because that was the first step in my recovery. Like, right, I'm not going to do the second part. Obviously, binging was an emotional kind of coping mechanism for me then. And so I'd gained weight a lot. And I didn't know how to process it. And I really just had to cocoon myself for two months. No phone. I had to baby myself. Luckily, we're still in lockdown era, kind of. So you, Gosh, it was very right, normal okay. to just hide yourself for two months. Yeah. It wasn't necessarily nowadays where you're like, where are you? Like, what are you doing? Um, so did you yeah. have like professional help throughout that period? Yeah. So I got a eating disorder specialist actually through Gymshark. Which, oh, fantastic. Yeah, I really, yeah. they were... It was straight on it. I was like, I need therapy. And the first thing she said to me was like, you don't need a kind of recovery eating plan, which people go on, you know, let's do things a nice way. Let's gain weight in this. And we'll talk about a few things. She was like, you have so much trauma. You need like full on normal therapy. You, like this is not even about an eating disorder anymore because within the call I opened up to her, about, you know, I've been through this, this and this. And she was like, oh my God, no wonder you have an eating disorder. No wonder you've been through depression and these things because you've had so much going on in your life. 
I have never had any support with that. So the first thing was finding a really good therapist and yeah, started my therapy journey. And that's really where things started to shift. Yeah. Because I've had therapy every week. I'd say for the last two years, Mm -hmm. there was a gap in the middle when I changed therapist. And that was a really important part for me because I kind of outgrew. I don't want to say outgrew my first therapist, but it wasn't working for me. It took me a while for me to realize. And then the one I have now, we've probably been doing it for like, yeah, two years now, I think. Every week. Yeah, because I I was going to sort of mention that about how I know you've been quite like open and honest about therapy and Mm. having therapy and the benefits of it and that sort of thing. And I think like it's just uh, something it's something that I really believe like everyone should go through and I completely understand that it's not something that's like viable for a lot of people I myself have also been getting weekly therapy for um two years and mine was actually and I've said it before in videos but um certainly in the UK I didn't have the means at all to pay for it but I really really needed help I was at a complete rock bottom and to the point where I couldn't even navigate where to go like what direction to sort of move in to like get myself better um and there's actually charities out there that you pay what you can afford and I could only afford five pound per session and so that's what I would pay but what charity was that um so it was local to my council but there's a lot out there if you go to your anyone listening in the UK (laughs) um if you do reach out to your uh, GP that they can refer you and then you can get help and like I'm just so thankful that I did it and I am like a lot you know in a much better position now and I've worked through so much stuff but like yeah I just really wish it was something that if anyone has the means to sort of spend some money on themselves I really would say 100% so. do you have anything um obviously that this isn't always like an option that people can go for because of like financial like limitations but is there anything else sort of practice wise that you've taken from therapy that you could sort of recommend to people if they were trying to um you know beyond just I mean eating disorder recovery but just like yeah just in general like, kind of yeah, mental like health. reflections or journaling. Yeah. like have you so journaling is great and understanding that your journal is there for you you're not obliged to write in it every day. It's not a chore. As soon as you make it a chore and that you have to write in it every morning, then you start kind of not liking it. And if you miss one day, you'll be like, right, that's me for the week. I can't journal. I use my journal as a support system for me. When I'm really, really struggling, it's there for me. I will go to it. I'll write down all my thoughts. And that's really helpful. One of the things that my therapist really taught me was, you know, it's this idea of, when you're down or you're triggered, you know, when you're so anxious or something has really set you off, whether it's a comment or an experience or a situation, you're in a unregulated space. You're a bit everywhere. And a regulated space, you're nice and calm. No matter if your to-do list is the same, you see it in a different way. You're like, I can do this. I feel calm. It's how you feel after exercise. Exercise is a way of regulating your body. And so what she did at the beginning, and I don't have this list anymore, she made me physically write out a list of things that made me feel good and regulating things, things like having a shower, having a bath, listening to music and shaking, you know, shaking your ass, (laughs) having a little dance, (laughs) going to the gym, going on a walk, standing outside, eating some food, you know, doing a face mask and watching a movie. So you write down these lists, even like deep breaths. And depending on how triggered you are, you go through that list until you feel better. So let's say you come in from whatever you've done and your your anxiety is high. You are ready for a two hour doom scroll. Do you know what I mean? When you're certainly not right. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like you could scroll on your phone. You you can't look after yourself. You're in this weird kind of anxious space. Mm -hmm. First thing, right? We're gonna shower. Even worse, we're gonna bath. (laughs) If we need to really soak you, (laughs) we're gonna shower. Right? Get that soap on you. Hot water. Flush it all off. Okay, skincare. Okay, comfy clothes. Nice and relaxing. Put some food on. Okay, now maybe do some deep breaths or journaling. Um, You know, can we do any dancing in the shower kind of thing? And you go through that list and you'll find yourself calm down. You'll just slow down. And to get into that space is where you're in more touch with yourself. You can understand what's going on. You can look at things better. Things aren't so, like overcrowded I don't know yeah because I think the purpose that 
I certainly see with journaling and therapy is that they both offer this space, this like kind of like space to get everything that's floating around in your head down onto like paper or out right and it's like it gives you this kind of skill to be able to like reflect and I see that in you massively and I think that I mean not to put words in your mouth but I I I wonder that must have had a big impact in your recovery and you growing as a person and you being so mature and like all these things that we're talking about I feel like journaling and therapy and like looking at yourself and understanding yourself and why you work the certain way you do why experiences have like had an impact on you from when you were a child from your dad like everything yeah it like, all like a lot of reflection has gone on yeah right and it really helps so just because you don't have the means to sort of to have therapy like there's definitely other things like yeah so I remember it really surprised me when you told me that you I mean how how early was it into your social media journey you had Gymshark reach out to you I think a month <laughs> just like bonkers people. yeah yeah that's completely I got signed within surreal. six weeks I think yeah it was crazy absolutely surreal um I did want to like I know this is going back to childhood a bit but I I've I've seen or I've heard you mention about like kind of thinking oh you know I want to be a PE teacher oh I maybe want to be a PT yeah and about how you've kind of reflected about how in ways you actually in a roundabout way are doing those things and those things that like made you think oh I might want to pursue that you're actually doing and I really wonder because I feel completely the same wanted to be a PE teacher wanted to be a doctor because I wanted to help people and in ways I am kind of doing that yeah and I wonder like do you feel with the rise to kind of like I guess fame that is what it is but like with the rise to fame that you had and you know your journey and your path with all of it the messy parts and everything do you feel like this was like your calling and like do you feel like this is what you were sort sort of meant to be doing yeah I think I said when I was younger that I want to be a PE teacher but I want to do something more I kind of yeah wanna I heard do some that. lectures yeah. or like do some talks <laughs> yeah And so now that I think about it, I'm like, it makes complete sense. Yeah. Because I'm doing that, but on a scale that you can fit. It's not just how many people you can fit in a room, but how many necessarily views or whatever you can get. Like, it's kind of, you're kind of unstoppable in a way of like how many people you can share your message with. And so looking back, yes, it makes total sense. But it was so weird because I could have never have guessed it because as I said earlier, like I wasn't really on socials when I was younger. I didn't watch YouTubers. I didn't know. So I think in a way it kind of helped my account when I started because I had no idea what you were supposed to do. So I did what I wanted to do. Yeah, I so see that. I so see that in in even your content now. How is your balance with social media now? Like it feels as in Like work life? Um, more so like you balancing sort of like other people's opinions and yeah. the noise that comes with being a content creator it's definitely I've gone through waves depending on what my growth has been like okay so when I kind of plateaued for a year I became really kind of comfortable I was like okay like I'm I'm really comfortable in this space and then when I grow I'm like oh there's a lot more faces or there's a lot more kind of ears around And, you know, opening up recently, I have struggled because there has been quite a lot of growth. And in a way, I've kind of like, not self-sabotaged, but I've pulled back because I'm scared of the growth because I've started taking it into account a little bit. Whereas I know in my true kind of regulated, non-anxious self that I don't really care about that stuff. And In Australia, I had quite a few videos that went like really, really viral about my personal life. And (laughs) if you know, you know. (laughs) And it made me really anxious. Did it? Because I was like, why do people care so much? This is so scary. Like, Like, you've got like commenting really specific things. And that was when I was kind of told by a few people in my life, you can't be checking that stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. And since then... I have not checked stuff on TikTok, which is so new for me because I used to check TikTok the way I used to check Instagram. Like, oh, how are some posts doing? What are the comments about? Nowadays, I'm like, I post and I leave the app. Okay. And that's very rare for me. Like, so, Oh, so that's not been the case for you up until no, like, recent? I, I would never do it in a negative way. I'd never sit there kind of 
oh my God, what are people saying about me? Because I won't lie, my community are amazing and they've only ever got positive things to say. But when I had a few videos go around about my personal life, it definitely caused a shift. And I was like, oh, I don't want to see any of that now. Like that's kind of, that's kind of scary. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think the important thing is that it's not really about what's out there and the comments you're getting. It's where you're at in yourself and how you're receiving them. Yeah. And 100%. so I don't think anything has necessarily changed recently. I yeah. think in myself, I've just been a little bit lower. And so things are able to come in more. And so I've kind of been scared away. And so I've kind of been like, right, I'm not going to post it. I'm not going to say anything online. I'm just going to hide in my little shadow. Um, But already like today and stuff I felt a little bit better and I feel like you're just coming I'm coming on the rise again and within that my perception will change and so nothing's ever actually changing in the outside world it's just kind of where you're at in yourself yeah and knowing that that's what you can manage and not what you think's going on outside yeah I, I heard something recently and I don't know where I heard it from but they were saying like I think they were comp- referencing you know social media and saying it's not your business to know other people like to you know care about other people's opinion i completely and utterly butchered that (laughs) we get the vibe it was like but it was like it's not your business like other people's opinions are not your business yeah that was it um and i thought that was so true it's like you know you're choosing to share that and that's fine and it's you don't need other people's my therapist always says you're being you and you can't you have to be unapologetically you you Mm. cannot apologize for being yourself and Things will get you in a twist when it wasn't yourself. Like, let's say you post a video and you're not quite happy with it. It's not quite you, but you post it. That's when you'll feel the twist. Because you're like, well, that wasn't quite me and it hasn't done well. You post being you and yourself and you've tried your hardest. It doesn't matter what happens post kind of like you putting it out. Um, So I think that's definitely something that's helped me. Like, if I'm being myself, that's what you can ask for. Yeah, for sure. Do you think of yourself as, like, if you were going to name, like, do you think you're quite a resilient person? Like, especially having been sort of exposed to, like, intense social media at such a, like, I don't know, young, impressionable age. I know what you mean. Like, do you have coping mechanisms? You know, as someone who's a new creator, I still very much battle with this a lot like I'm definitely in the phases you've spoken about passing I see yeah and do you get affected by is it present comments being like are they judging you or is it you're taking it into your own head um are the comments being rude I think it's more about I it's not necessarily about comments it's more about performance yes and that's where I try to really be this is why I'm asking you about resilience because I try to be really resilient and I don't look at things like that and I try to just really get back to the core of like why why am I doing this yeah I'm not doing it for x amount of followers or x amount of things and I think you know I really try to like work on like authenticity and like my authentic code and stuff like that and that looking at views and figures and stuff like that that doesn't align with that so I just wondered like do you do you think of yourself as a resilient person having kind of gone through quite a lot with social media being I on a real so. journey with it. especially when I am in contact with other like influencers and not necessarily you but like other friends and I kind of see the way they cope with things and I'm like oh my god you can't take that personally you have to have this and it's like even just small things you don't have a personal phone how do you ever switch off from socials you you don't switch off at a certain time you're working all day yes you're doing like I've had to learn that throughout the years and there is no handbook of how to do what we do no and I think a lot of people keep quiet about it because there is this whole kind of thing of like you're working for yourself you've got a great life and we do we are so privileged we're probably one of the most privileged people on earth to be able to do what we want create what we want But it doesn't mean that we aren't hard on ourselves, especially if we're high achievers, we're going to want to perform and create and achieve, achieve, achieve. And in the process of me doing it for three and a half years now, I've learned several things which have helped me kind of, I don't know, create boundaries. I think Mm. it's about creating boundaries. I was so going to say boundaries. Yeah. Listening to you just then, you are so like, like, 
you really do have set boundaries in yeah. place. And I remember you saying, in fact, I perhaps it was in that very long taxi <laughs> car ride. The taxi car ride. But I remember, you know, at the time, I did not take any days off. And that is not like, a flex. Yeah. That is like a... Uh, perhaps a slight addiction to the new world that I'd found myself yeah. accidentally in, and it's very normal. You said time. you said to me like, "No, no, you need to be taking time off, mm-hmm. and you need a separate phone." And you kind of were just passing on. I probably overloaded like, you a bit much. I think yeah. I like well, overwhelmed you. I was yeah. like, "You need this. You need that. You need that." Yeah, but it was really clear to see t- for me to see then and to see now that you do have really strong boundaries in place. Yeah, and you do protect that. I think you have to though. Yeah. I think I just wanted to add like with the whole you're so like you can't complain because you're an influencer and you are so lucky and you've got things so easy. I completely get that and I get people's understanding. What I feel that has been honestly a bit like has been a struggle for me and was something that I think is a struggle with being sort of in the world of social media is that it's a real am I swearing on this podcast it's a head fuck (laughs) like having that many people's opinions yeah like you know about your daily life however much you choose to share like it's not normal it's not something we've evolved to like have to deal with you know and I think that's probably like the challenges when you are feeling more vulnerable suddenly like those voices get even louder and 100% I remember there was a year when it was when I first moved to London and this is like post recovery, like still kind of in it, but my content isn't all around it. I, my new obsession, you know, it wasn't exercise, it was productivity. And I had such a fear that people thought that I got this easy and I got the job easy and that I have an easy life that I thought, okay, I'm going to work twice as hard or just my absolute max capacity to prove to people that I'm working the same as they are in a corporate job, if not more, to make them accept me and be like, please accept me as like a human. Like, I promise you, I'm not just like an influencer that gets all of this like easy. Like I would post on my stories, my daily schedule and I would start at like 6 a.m. and finish at like 9 p.m. and be like, right, then I'm able to switch off and read for 10 minutes and then go to bed. And, and I was actually doing everything I said, but I was doing it so that I could show people I was working hard. And one of my biggest steps forward was doing less work to protect myself, to understand that quality over quantity. If I take a step back, you know, this evening, if I take a step back, yes, in reality, I could edit a video and put a post up, but I have two events tomorrow that I want my energy to come through. So I'm going to take this evening off. I'm going to get delivery. I'm going to eat. I'm going to watch a film and I'm going to go to bed so I can re-energize for my events tomorrow. And again, I have a gap in my events tomorrow. I could edit a video that I need to get out or I can rest so I can have equal energy for both events and my true self can come out. And those are the things that I prioritize. And then it's like, okay, Monday, you'll get on it. I don't care if you have work, but after 5 p.m. you're going to switch off. And so you can rejuvenate Mm -hmm. for your next day. And so it's always thinking about the long term, the consistency, the can I do this tomorrow? Yeah. Um, Really understanding what actually needs to get done in the day. Can you do anything more? But I have become so good at stopping that part of my brain that goes, not enough. You know? Yeah. Because every day you could sit down at the end of the day, come to 5, 6 p.m. Oh, what about making one more video? I know. What about doing one more thing? Why not reply on WhatsApp for another hour? Mm -hmm. No, this is my time. Like, really having that boundary with yourself and knowing that that's your time to rejuvenate and it's going to take you so much further. Yeah, it's like you you see you see your time and your downtime as non-negotiable. Yeah. And I think that's so powerful and that's something I absolutely need to work on and I am working on in ways but then also like I definitely go through like cycles of just getting burnout because yeah. for me it is that piece of like oh Am I am I enough? Am I doing enough? Am I, yeah. you know, being You are enough? more than enough. Yeah. You are amazing. Yeah. You are. You are You're smashing it. And the thing is that anyone else on the other side of the camera, you know, it could be for both of us, but definitely for you, like, they're going to be like, are you crazy? Like, yeah. you are amazing. You're doing this. And one thing that Sam actually told me um, when I first started Gymshark, 
I remember I started getting really overwhelmed and I, I was growing. I think I reached like 100K or something. And I was like, Sam, like people are asking for this recipe and this workout. And he said, people will always want more, Anna. And that stuck with me my whole career is that people will always want more. And it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing that you're not delivering it. It's a good thing that they even want it, and that they care. But you do not have to deliver to everyone. You know, if you think about your favorite creator, someone you really look up to, and you would go, oh my God, please share me your glute workout. And they haven't done it. You don't want them to actually feel bad if they haven't done no, that for you. No, no, no. You're even like, oh my God, they like, I can't believe they saw my comment. Do you know what I mean? But yeah. you don't have that opinion over them and people don't have that opinion over you. If they're asking for things and you don't have the time to deliver, no one's actually getting mad. They just want more from you, which is essentially a good thing. Yeah, no, for sure. I think it's really lovely that like, what I'm hearing as well is that you've taken action to slow down yeah. in a world that wants you to be faster. Oh my God. And do more. And yeah. like, even with your recent trip to Australia and like, you know, this like period of your life you're in where you're, you know, posting less and stuff like that. Like, I don't see, I mean, perhaps you do have fear, but I don't see a fear in you of like, oh my gosh, but I'm not posting dailies. I, yeah. I remember in that conversation we had like, you know, a long time ago now like you saying girl what are you doing posting like multiple times a day like yeah. just slow down. slow down you don't need to like you have a, we have a fear that you're gonna fall off that I was gonna care about you yeah and all of these things and I totally get it and I used to not be able to do any of that I think it was when I took the two month break off my socials and that was so scary I had no idea when I came back on that I would have people support me and to this day when I go to events 50% of the people go I followed you three years ago and I'm like you're crazy like you stuck around like that's crazy um but honestly slowing down and it's exactly what you said in a world that they want you to like do more I think it's such a power to slow down yeah. and be like, it's okay, actually. I'm chilling. And I think I do it because I know how I get like when I don't slow down. And the last two weeks has been a representation of that. If I just take a moment to reflect on myself, I... <laughs> as you should be. As I should, you know, we are podcasting. <laughs> but every day there has been a to-do list, which I haven't been able to get done. And I still switch off at 5, 6 p.m., you know, maybe 6, have my dinner and stop. But while I'm stopping, I'm anxious about my to-do list the next day because I have a feeling that it will never go away. And all I want to do is the things that I love. I don't want to do finance. I don't want to do admin. I want to create videos. And feeling like I can't do it, do that and feel like I can only do the things I enjoy once I've completed the to-do list, it's quite a cycle to be in because the to-do list never stops in my world and I'm sure in your world too. Mm-hmm. And I think what I've started to understand is you have to create time, have to understand that not everything's going to get done and also reassure yourself, be that voice for yourself that it's okay. Like just take a moment to breathe and be like, you know what? Things aren't going to come crashing down. I'm pretty sure I set that deadline myself. (laughs) You said that to me earlier. You're like, who set the deadline? I thought, all right. I did. I, I did. Literally. I am working to this like impossible I'm, deadline. I'm making a video at the moment, and every day it doesn't go out. I'm like, oh, silly goose. Oh, yeah. bless goose. <laughs> QC's here. Sorry. <laughs> but actually, I think about it. I'm the one who wanted it out three days ago. No one knows the video exists, <laughs> and like, so it can go out any day. Yeah, I think for me, it's like this fear that, like, it's gonna, everything's gonna. I'm, I'm so, like. I'm so aware of how fortunate I am and how you just you know, don't want to lose I'm living it. my absolute wildest dreams at the age I am and it kind of came by chance and I think it's a fear that it's going to leave as quickly as it came. Yeah. And I think as soon as I get it into my head that that's not the case, you know, then yeah. that will make some progress, but I think what helped for me is when I started having in-person events, you understand that people are coming a short way, a long way, to come see you in person. And that is the element that calmed my brain. That was like, yeah, you know what? It's not just numbers. These are people. I know. And they have connections. And the way that you're helping them, they're helping you. Like, 
it's just you have a relationship and no one just yeah maybe five percent or one percent of your following goes down Mm. because they're just random people but everyone else they followed for a reason and unless you do something disastrous (laughs) and something really like wrong in the world people aren't gonna leave and that's just I guess that's my kind of like view on it but people out there like you don't post for a week they'll watch oh, yeah. they'll well, watch what you watch when you post we give all the people we follow so much grace you know but we don't give it to ourselves no. so um okay so having said all of that how on earth do you balance training we haven't even touched on training i really. know and like you've definitely been i would say like living the hybrid sort of lifestyle yeah She's a hybrid, girly. She's a hybrid girly um for quite some time how do you possibly f- balance fitting that into your life and do you give yourself yeah. grace with are you more rigid and structured with that or do you give no not at all grace you know I, I do give myself a lot of grace and I think it's even interesting you hearing me like not hearing me hearing you describe me in a way of like hybrid and all that stuff because I'm like really like I'm out here just kind of doing my thing Vibing. like like yeah. when I think hybrid and I think of those people online you know, training in that way. Mm -hmm. I'm like, they have got some intense routines. They are out there training loads of times a day or like lots of times a week doing all of these specific workouts. For me, the only part that is specific at the moment is my marathon training. So I do three runs a week. I follow that. Everything else, I'm kind of freeballing it. Yeah. You know, if I want to do some pull-ups one day, if I kind of want to train with a friend another day, if I want to do a bit of high rocks, I'm doing that. But I'm not going to come out here and say, okay, I do four strength training sessions a week and three running sessions I don't so if I was going to ask you what is your training split yeah would you say whatever I damn like (laughs) yeah literally like whatever I fancy I am in a process of getting a high rocks coach to basically plan my three other sessions of the week so three running three gym and so it's just a bit more structured and normally I'm really against that like if you stalk my profile I'll literally most of the time I'll be like I don't follow a plan I don't need it Mm -hmm. That is great, apart from when you are actually training for things. I do need it. And the fact that I'm doing high rocks competition in Berlin, I do kind of need it. So that's why I'm going on to it. Um, But yeah, kind of a relaxed approach. And what's so interesting is that although my accounts are based on fitness, I will prioritize editing over going to the gym. So I will cut my gym sessions short so I can edit an extra video or get more work done. And behind the scenes, well, no, not behind the scenes, to an audience, they could think, oh my gosh she all she like all she needs to do in her day is go to the gym I know. like your job is literally go to the gym I'm like are you no, no. oh my god so much more. I do like 40 minutes in the gym rush out sit in a coffee shop for four hours straight go home and eat lunch do do another like <laughs> do 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 <laughs> another few hours of whatever yeah obviously I switch off in the evening and I don't need to be like a hella productive queen all the time but my my life isn't just like stroll into the gym oh no what i do love about australia is the fact that no one is in my time zone or at least like I people saying, that i work yeah. with and so i do stroll into the gym and i'm like you're telling me i've got like a whole hour and a half or however long i want like i don't last more than an hour and a half because i just yeah. get hungry but um like it's such a different lifestyle over there whereas in london i'm just like go 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 Yeah, it's funny because I always say to people, like, the irony is that I'm a gym girly who doesn't have time to go to the gym. Yeah, literally, (laughs) literally. You know, I struggle a lot at the moment trying to fit my sessions in. Is your preference, like, so do you, so, like, help me get into your head. So a week of training, like, as you are right now before you get a high rocks coach, um, is that just, like, you go as and when you like in the day and do you just think, oh, today I want to do some biceps. Yeah, quite you... literally. Yeah, okay. Um, And so sometimes I'll train twice a week. Sometimes I'll train three times a week, depending on how many events I'm doing. Like this week I've got marathon training, which is three runs a week, plus two run clubs because I've got, I'm on tour at the moment. So that's two extra 5K. So I'm running five days out of the week, but I'm having to skip one anyways because I have my ankle. So we are only doing four. But anyways, I think I've, gone to the gym like twice this week um very sure I go in there I tend to do upper aware that I need to train legs as well for my running but that is literally like one or two exercises so it is very kind of free ball do some pull-ups do some upper body exercises there is no kind of set plan 
I'm not doing a specific number of reps or sets or exercises. And so I'm just doing it to kind of keep me happy. The process of going to the gym really makes me happy. And so even if I have a run in the evening, sometimes I will do the process of the gym <laughs> and then stretch for 20 minutes. Like yep. I'll get a coffee, put a cute outfit on. Well, put a cute outfit on, go get coffee, go to the gym, stretch. Just kind, Only of, str- just kind of like being in the environment, yep. headphones on, music playing, you know, maybe do like a really light session, leave within half an hour and start my work and I'm in such a better mindset and that's the way that I use exercise now I use it as a tool and then in terms of running it really teaches me a lot about myself and that I can always do more than I think it teaches me discipline because I need to do the three runs a week and if you skip most of your runs you're suddenly not training for a marathon and so it's kind of having those I guess that's why I like the hybrid style of training is because I'm able to kind of use the gym for one reason and use the running for another reason Mm. I love like this I it's so funny I've gone through such so many different like transitions in sort of like my mindset towards like jumping on the bandwagon all the rage is running right now all the rage is high rocks but something I really love about it is this kind of like new attitude towards exercise that it seems everyone has where it's a lot more sort of like um goal oriented in the sense that I don't know in ways hear me out it feels like we're going back to like our childhood years yeah of like having working fun towards something and having yeah. fun and like socializing it's really performance just goals not even, it just feels like people have moved very far from aesthetics which of course if that makes you happy cool yeah but it just seems really lovely that like it feels like people are really focusing on like how can how 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 can I, I feel better? Body? Yeah. Like, how can I? What can I do? Like how can I move my body in a way? That's I I definitely think that's true, challenge. and I think. You know, you can tell because if you look at kind of videos. You're not necessarily using your body, as, the reason why you're doing it. Whereas I think in the past, let's say if you do a what I eat in a day video people will put their body first and you're like, right, that's the goal. They're going to eat in a certain way. If I copy it, I'll look like that. Yeah. Or here's, we're gonna, I'm going to show you my body and then we're going to do a certain workout and you will look like that. Whereas now I feel like the workout itself is the priority. You know, it's how you're feeling on the run. It's the fact that you were running with a friend and they were laughing and, and eating an almond croissant after you go on a run. Do you know what I mean? It's that kind of energy that I think is like really good about the community at the moment. I agree. Yeah. Okay, we have to talk then all the madnesses that are going on, where you're at now with High Rocks in Berlin, Anna on the run, UK tour, all that jazz, like doing the absolute most. Like, yeah, tell us, has that been sort of something that's, has that come from being in Australia? Like, I feel like, were you doing different sort of training? Yeah, so I... I, You were training with Ollie, wasn't it? Yeah, Yeah. so I was doing High Rock sessions in the summer once a week but really social as like a friend's thing like all of our friends went I never really thought about doing a competition I was just like oh I'm just it's a workout class that I get to see my friends yeah it was like a Thursday after school club or something I know I honestly I wish I lived in London yeah it was really cute and so that's kind of where Harrock started and then I went to Australia and it was in October it was really weird on this really small island in Australia the there is no signal there is no nothing like you go there and you camp there was a camp next to us and there was a guy called ollie who i'd previously met before at a gymshark event he was like oh my god anna and i was like hello like do i know you and he was like yeah we met before and on that kind of one day of like hanging out a bit we were like should we do high rocks together and we came off the desert island and booked high rocks competition and we're like right let's do berlin next year and so that's how high rocks came about um and then running I've kind of been running the whole year now but not training for anything crazy like I've been I've done quite a few races in 2023 I did a half marathon race a 10k a 5k so I was always working towards something but taking on the LA marathon was definitely like a big goal well not a big goal I did not think I was going to be doing it but when I was offered do you want to go to LA I was like yeah and then I kind of realized I had to do the marathon (laughs) um runner the company have like an investor in yeah um yeah I just started like working them as a partnership and obviously it was coming to like paid partnerships and we couldn't really like 
come into like agreement with the paid partnerships and I was just like it, it just doesn't make sense to me to do it at a certain rate um and then kind of came up with this idea of taking equity within the company and I was like okay this is new this is scary I'm like a female like I don't know about this stuff I'm just a girl oh my god it's my favorite saying I'll get beeped out and be like I'm just a girl <laughs> But it's like, I'm just a girl. And so I was like, cool, fun, I'll take it on. Um, anyways, fast forward to a couple of months ago. Well, actually, last summer. They were like, would you like to run the LA Marathon? And I was like, LA, yes. And then I realised I'd sign up to another marathon. Now, I've done one before, and that was the worst thing I'd ever experienced my whole entire life. Oh, was it? Oh, my God. I never thought I would do one again. I thought at least five years. Here I am a year and a half later. But you know what? I have really enjoyed the process. Have you? It's kept me really happy. Really? Like I did 30k the other day and like I, I felt strong and I was like, how? I see you out here and I'm like... I'm like, why do I feel strong in a 30k? That's weird. What do you... What do you do? What do you mean? When you run for that long. Like, so, I have just started and I'm like, okay, love her. But like after 5k, I'm ready to get my coffee and pastry. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm just wondering like, well, what do you do? So in my 30k, I ran 21 with a friend. Okay. So big chunk of the beginning with a friend. And I actually Talking? think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Because we're running this at a conversational pace. Okay. So we're having a big old catch up, chatting about stuff. Love that. You know, there are points of silence. But that's kind of nice at points, just catching your breath yeah. and thinking your thoughts. And then the last 9K really went quickly. Well, long as in I was getting stitches and I was out of breath and I was pushing myself. But when you've done 21K, nine is like just the ending. So home straight at that point. Um, and I don't listen to music on my runs. So I was just listening to the birds tweet, listening to my voice out of breath. Like, <gasps> yeah. <laughs> um. But I'm just focusing. I'm focusing on technique. I'm being present. I'm trying to hit my pace. So I, there's a lot of things to focus that keeps my brain busy. I like to do a lot of calculations in my head. Cal- for what? So I like maths, right? <laughs> do you? Yeah. And so like, I like calculate things that don't need to be calculated on my run. If I run at this pace for this long, <laughs> how long would it take me to get to here? And if I run to there, will it, how long? And it just keeps my brain busy. And, and in a happy way, not a toxic Yeah, happy yeah, just in like a just happy, like, a, kind of like maths, like numbers. Oh my gosh, she's a little maths girly <laughs> out here. What, I, I love it. Yeah. Wow, okay, no, me and maths could never. Like, I literally do try and do like a little bit of bar maths and I am done. I'm <laughs> done for. I've started doing CrossFit and like using a 15 bar with the ladies bar. Yeah. It's thrown my Oh, it's thrown you right off. out. I'm just like, I'm just a girl. I'm just a girl <laughs> please, and I need a somebody, 20 bar. Please, somebody help me. Um, okay, oh. cool. So like your journey into running, like, do you have any tips for people that are getting into it? Yes. Oh my God. I could totally spell. I just like, and I'm sure so many people are listening thinking, I, I want to be a girly just running, saying that 9K is literally nothing. And yeah. I'm sure we all have that in us, but it feels like so intense. So I want to know like, how did you get to that point? Yeah. How did you, I don't know, get to a point where you just like I would really say enjoy it. And- the first thing is don't compare yourself to people online. When you're training for different things, distances look different to everyone. So take me six months ago. If someone had said run 25K, I'd be like, excuse me, what? Nowadays, because I'm training 30Ks, I'm like, okay, yeah, I can do a 25. So don't compare yourself. You know, if, if you're out there running 5Ks, and you see someone go, oh, yeah, 10K was easy. And you're like, but that's really hard for me. No, well, yeah, of course it is. You're training 5Ks. And that's completely okay. Like, everyone starts in different places. So firstly, you don't compare yourself to people online. Um, the next thing is run slower than you think. The times where I wasn't making any improvements, you know, maybe when I was like 18 and I was like trying to go on some runs and I'd only run 5K, I could never run it under 30 minutes. And it was because every run I was maxing out. I was trying to run my fastest. So even if the beginning was a jog, I was sprinting by the end. Now, when you're running, you've got different heart rate zones. If you go into your anaerobic zone, so zone three, you are training a different part of your body. So if you keep your heart rate lower, you are training the aerobic part of your body, which is what you need when you're running. Mm -hmm. So people are out there thinking, oh, if I just run a bit faster, I'll lose more calorie, like I'll burn more calories, I'll lose more fat, I'll get fitter. Surely if I run faster, I will be able to run faster in the future. But actually the science shows that when you run slower, you're building your aerobic systems to in the future be able to run faster. 
it's kind of weird but basically my tip is to run slow in your runs keep your heart rate lower and don't like for me personally I'll keep my heart rate below 145 so 145 beats per minute if I'm doing an easy run just to make sure that I'm in the kind of comfortable range and if you don't have like a heart rate tracker being able to hold a conversation means you're in the right zone yeah if you're not able to hold a conversation you're probably actually running a bit too fast and so just to slow it down um and that has shown like major improvements yeah i i um have been saying like even on my literally could count on two hands like the amount of runs i've done but even i've been saying to people when they say sid so happy you're joining the running like yeah squad and i say you know running how I'm doing at a slower pace gosh it's so pleasant compared to like yes. my sort of understanding of running prior to that which yeah. was just holding loads of bags and sprinting for a bus <laughs> and so it's like because I was just thinking no I can't run because all I was ever doing was sprinting for a bus, a bus. carrying load of, loads of bags so yeah it's like yeah actually I can completely understand it's so what different with that you know another tip is running with people when you're running with a friend or a run club time will fly like nothing else you Mm. are not thinking about the little like aches and pains you're not thinking about the fact that you're out of breath unless you're really out of breath it's obviously going to become apparent but just it goes so much quicker so if you're struggling to like run a bit longer and slower you know go to a friend and be like right I want to run a bit further today can we keep it slow can we just chat the whole time and you'll realize like you can keep going yeah. um and so that's like a really you know good tip yeah. well good to you know what I mean. no i have to i have to shout out do a shameless plug for our gym girls locker room run clubs that we're doing we have them every month in london london and manchester and you know it, it's so this is a world that i'm not at all involved with um however i've been attending them and it's i think just it is so powerful like running with a group of women and it's realizing empowering. it's so empowering but not only that it's like you do just feel like you get carried along with the group you know the vibes have, yeah exactly pure vibe running on pure vibes um, yeah. but it, it's so interesting that like you know there'll be girls that go that have never ever done a 5k and yet they're able to do it just because they're with that is a pro- group. probably yeah. one of my favorite things is because I have a run club too and you have people come and they go that was my first ever 5k and I'm like see you can do more than you think and that's what running has done for me you know when I look at my run that I've got in a few days, it's 34 kilometers. I could go, well, can you like, it's been a while since you've done that, like over a year, like, can you do it? You come to the day, you prove to yourself you can do it and you go home thinking, okay, I can do more than I think I can do. And that's what happens when you run a bit further every time. It's you, you're just showing yourself and you take that into other areas of your life and go, okay, well, I think I can't do this in my career or business, but I didn't think I could do like 20k or I didn't think I could do this or and you show yourself you can and I don't know it's a really good cycle it seems like I've I I definitely see that like running is such a like mental challenge but I definitely noticed that so early on with exercising is that it really like if you're showing up for yourself with whatever form of exercise you're doing you there are so many transferable skills and you are just proving to yourself that okay if I'm able to do that outside yeah. my comfort zone if I'm able to challenge myself if I'm able to reach that goal then I am so easily you know able to do that in other areas of my life completely yeah. it's just it hypes you up yeah absolutely what's um so like what's next with like run clubs and with yeah. just life all things Anna right so I guess when I was in Australia around Christmas time I wasn't in England and so things were kind of like getting booked up for the next few months And so from January to the end of April, I'm quite busy. I've got quite a lot of stuff going on. Probably why I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed right now because I said yes to... What's funny is that I thought I said no to a lot of things. And I'm like, how is there still so much? This girl is in demand. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, girl. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so I'm currently doing a run club tour. I'm marathon training. I... What else am I doing? I've got the LA Marathon in March. I've got high rocks competition in berlin in april yeah but yeah i think even just like making videos and stuff is like a full-time job and so the fact that i'm kind of training for something big and on like tour at the moment with events it's just really hard like it's i'm like 
but I normally spend all my time making videos. So now you're taking away 50% of my time and I need two days recovery post events. <laughs> how do I, how do I fit it all in? No, honestly, I don't know. I haven't worked out. If you haven't worked out, I haven't worked out. We're so getting not, there. No, it's very exciting. I'm so excited to follow you with whatever you do um, because we love you. Okay, well, I think that is everything. Aww. Genuinely, thank you so much for oh coming. I think it's always just like, I, honestly, anything you do, anything you say, it's just like so, there's so much to take from it. I think you're a really, really special person. You're going to make me cry. Oh, it's fine, I can't. Because no. you probably feel it, but when people say like, oh, you've helped me or what you do is great, there's a part of you that goes, what? What do you mean? What part? Like, how? And obviously I hear other people say it, but even you say it right there. I'm like, my brain's trying to navigate, but like, what What do you mean? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And like, I, it just it just means a lot, especially like the week that I've been going through. Like, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I just, you're, you're someone I so look up to. Like you, oh. no matter like how hard or like whatever struggles you're going through, like it's so clear to see like how much of a dent you've made in the fitness industry and I just know that you've made such a like big huge impact on so many people and I am so honored that you are our first guest I feel honored to be your first guest no like really really do appreciate it where can people find you if they if they don't already follow you oh um Anna Archer Fitness is pretty much all my socials I'm on YouTube as well Anna Archer and then my podcast is Inside Anna's Mind and yeah that's me. Oh, thank you so Thank much. you so much for having me. Thank you. <laughs>